The topic of my presentation is making a good impression. And to me, making a good impression seems like the kind of subtitle you would have for a self-help book. And I worked in book selling for about seven years. And whenever I thought about the self-help section or looked at it in its little corner that it was relegated to into the basement, quite correctly, I used to think that there was like a sign, a big red flashing sign that was saying, this is dodgy and not to be trusted. So I'm going to try to not sound like I'm a self-help guru or uh, a motivational speaker. That will be my, my challenge. What I do have, if not the qualifications to be a life coach or a motivational speaker, is an academic background in psychology, although now I'm a bit nervous because there's a real psychologist here today, so <laughs> I might get fined out. Um, what I also have as well is a very varied work background. And in the past, I didn't take that to be an advantage. It was always an obstacle. Whenever I had job applications to fill out, or I had to go to a job interview, I basically had to justify why I went from one totally random thing to one completely unconnected thing. But now, the value that I see in these different experiences is that I've worked in a lot of different environments, and I've worked with a lot of different people with different expectations. And having had that experience, what I think I can observe now is that when you see the same kinds of behavior and you see the same reactions from people in totally different environments, you're probably observing some fairly fundamental truths about the way people behave and what they react to. So these truths, as I see them, are what I've tried to take into teaching. And that's what I'm going to talk about for the next 10 minutes or so. We judge as humans all the time we have to judge what type of bread we want to buy. Do we like that haircut? Yes, I need a haircut. Do we want to buy that pair of shoes? What do we think about that person's accent? And sometimes these judgments can be fairly neutral, and sometimes they're value judgments. And one of the things that we do have a tendency to say to people when we've just met them, an opening kind of question is, what do you do? And it's a very bland question, and I try not to ask people that question, but it's very easy to slip into. And one of the things about this question is it's quite loaded with value judgments. So we're asking a person what they do, what's your job, and underneath that, we're going to make some assessment potentially of how successful we think they are, uh, how ambitious they are, how intelligent they are potentially. Now, I've worked a number of jobs that other people I know would say or have said were beneath them. And maybe some of you would as well, and you wouldn't want to do them. For example, I worked as a dishwasher in Glasgow. And the very first day that I started that job, I remember walking in to the bar, going up the stairs, and sitting at the bar was the manager of the restaurant bar whatever it was, it was a strange place. And I went up to the manager, shook his hand, we said hello, and I passed. The interaction lasted for about 15 seconds. But I've always remembered that moment because just that handshake and that greeting, to me, I could tell that I'd made a good impression. And I could also tell from him there was this reaction like, oh, that guy's got quite a good handshake. So even though I was going into this position that was probably the lowest that anyone could have, a person who was experienced and trained to look for positive signals, he recognized something positive about me, even though I was just going to wash dishes. So for the bar staff who were there, who had less of this kind of experience of looking for signals, what they were focusing on was the job that I did. And so for a lot of them, I could tell they didn't respect me because I was just the dishwasher. But to a manager who cared more about these things, he noticed the signs. To him, a good handshake was potentially more important than the job that he had. Maybe if I was still doing that 20 years later, that would have changed his opinion. But at that time, I think it had value. Sometime later in the same job, and I was still a kitchen porter at this time, a new chef 
started one morning and I was on the same shift as him and I went in and I met him and I said hello and we shook hands and it was the worst dead, wet, limp fish handshake that I can ever remember experiencing and it still haunts me now when I think about it. It was horrible and clammy and unconvincing and it just said to me that this person has absolutely no conviction about themselves and I had no confidence in him. And I tell you, no word of a lie, it was either that day or the next day he just walked out in the middle of the breakfast service, didn't tell anyone, just walked out, never came back. It was no surprise because he had demonstrated the kind of character that he had from the dead, wet fish. I, in my childhood and in my teenage years, was incredibly, brutally, crushingly self-conscious and shy. And when anyone was passing me on the street, say, if they smiled at me, they were laughing at me. They were constantly judging me. There was no, I had no capacity to be able to recognize any kind of like friendliness. It was all, oh my God, there's like something wrong with me. Um, and I don't know whether it was a sudden realization or something that kind of came to me slowly, but eventually I was kind of able to learn something fairly important about people, which has helped me in terms of being confident. And that is that basically any insecurity that any person has is really not that interesting or important to anyone else but themselves. My second toe is bigger than my big toe. No one could possibly care about that other than me. I used to be insecure that my ears stuck out and they were too big, that my front teeth were too big. No one cares about that. And that's something that's quite helpful to bear in mind when we're having social interactions or whether we're in some kind of workplace. Sometimes we might have someone that we are working with maybe as a teacher and we generally get on very well with them. And then something can happen during a lesson perhaps where we think, hmm, something went wrong there. I said the wrong thing. I made kind of an inappropriate comment and I see the reaction from them and they didn't like it. And now I'm gonna go home and I'm gonna obsess about it for the whole weekend and think, what have I done wrong? This is terrible. I'm gonna to have to leave the country and never be a teacher again. <laughs> and maybe you did do something terrible, but if you did do something terrible, it's probably gonna be fairly obvious. If there was something kind of innocuous that you said and you think it had a bad reaction, chances are, that person or those people didn't even notice. They didn't care. They weren't paying attention to that. They've got rent to pay. They've got some kind of 100 different issues that are far more pressing to them about the fact that you made some slightly strange comment and they seem to have a strange reaction to it. And even if the other people in that interaction did feel that there was some kind of problem, they've probably decided that it was their fault as well. Because generally, we are our own worst critics. Now you might say in response to this, but I can think of all kinds of examples where there are people that don't like me, I've got a boss that's giving me a hard time, I've got students that don't respect me, I've got friends that don't seem to, to kind of support me. And that might be true, but what I would say to that is that if there's a person who you feel has a problem with you and is antagonistic towards you, if that person is not able to express that in a sensitive and a constructive way, then fundamentally they have a problem with themselves. And that doesn't necessarily mean that it resolves the issue, but it's all a part of being able to be more empathetic and to see things from other people's points of view, which is very important. And being able to be empathetic is, like I say, very important. And it's all a part as well of being able to be more confident. But being confident is a difficult thing. So when you can't be confident, you have to fake it. When I was a manager, when I became a manager for the first time in book selling, I'd had maybe four years experience 
and I thought there's absolutely no way that I'm qualified to do this. I looked around me and there were experts everywhere. There were sales managers, there were regional managers, there was a CEO. They were so professional and knew exactly what they were doing. I was gonna have to be making spreadsheets. I was gonna have to be giving regular reports. I was gonna have to be leading a team. I was going to have to um, make financial plans, strategic plans. All of these things I thought I am not qualified to do. And what helped me a lot during that initial experience was the advice from my own managers. When I said this to them, I said, I don't think I'm qualified for this. I don't have the confidence. And they said, well, we all have to fake it. We all, I'm, I don't know what I'm doing half the time. I'm like, oh, right. But the really good, motivating people who can lead, and as teachers, we still need to be able to lead as well within lessons with a student to give them the confidence in the purpose of the lesson. We all, if we're successful, have to be able to just fake it sometimes when we're not feeling confident. Hopefully that isn't going to be 95% of the time, but just those little kind of cracks and bumps in the road or like the massive hole in my shoe when it's raining, we can manage to get across these by faking it. And I think realizing that other people are also sometimes faking it is very helpful because it then allows us a little bit more to accept when we make mistakes, because we're always going to make mistakes. And in fact, I was thinking about this just before I came up to this presentation. I thought, I'm giving a presentation about making a good impression. So basically, I have to make a good impression, because if I don't make a good impression, it undermines my whole presentation. But then I thought, well, if I don't do this very well, if I slip up, if I get some things wrong, that's gonna give confidence to the other people that have to talk after me. So actually, either way, I'm providing some kind of valuable service, whether I do this well or not. So that was reassuring for me. When I was about 17 in a school in Aberdeen in Scotland, I was taking an art class. And towards the end of the class, there was maybe about six or eight of us, of us students. The teacher who had known us for a few years she did quite a nice little thing with us. She, in front of all of us, gave a little kind of few word summary on what she thought were the, the skills and abilities, the main kind of strengths of each of us. Kind of like a little pep talk that would sort of push us on our way, like out of the nest and into the big bad world. And for each other person in the class, she was making these general comments about their kind of abilities and their strengths and what they could do well. And then she got to me and she said, uh, Tom, you have enough charm that you will be successful in anything that you choose to do. Don't rely on it, though. <laughs> oh, thanks. So maybe one of these days I'll learn to take her advice. Having a good handshake, being confident, being able to convince other people that you know what you're doing when maybe sometimes you don't know what you're doing. These things can all be important, but they're no substitute for actually putting in the work, in doing the work that you have to do to be informed, to be knowledgeable. But on the other hand, you can be the most hardworking person amongst those around you and still not get a good response because you're not making a good impression. So you can undermine all of that hard work that you do. Everyone has their own personal style. Some people are very demonstrative and friendly and cheerful, and some people are much more kind of introverted and shy. So I think I'm kind of like, uh, I'm like Derek Smalls from This Is Spinal Tap. I'm like in between fire and ice, tepid water, just kind of somewhere in the middle. If you've never seen that movie, that makes no sense, anyway. So, but the point is, it doesn't really matter what your personal style is, as long as you do it with conviction. And when I'm talking about handshakes, I'm not talking about some kind of Masonic secret thing that you get just at the right angle and the right pressure, and suddenly you unlock the person, and now they're your <laughs> psychic puppet. You know, a handshake is just one of the ways that we present ourselves. There's the handshake, there's eye contact, there's your posture, there's the tone of your voice. It's all indicators of engagement, of being engaged with your students, if you're a teacher. And the thing about being engaged 
is it demonstrates interest. And it feels good to be interesting. So for me, making a good impression with my students is about immediately engaging them and making them feel like they're the center of attention and finding ways to get them to focus on and talk about what they're passionate about. And it's also easy in a way because I am interested in my students. If you're interested in people, then being a teacher is great because you basically get paid to get people to tell you what they're passionate about. And I would never have imagined that I could be interested in golf. And I tried to watch the Ryder Cup the other day and I wasn't interested in it. I thought this is really boring. But during my classes with my two students who are passionate about golf, they make it seem really interesting. <laughs> so if you can draw that passion out of people, you can really get quite a lot. And then the best thing about it is too, is that you're then creating the positive associations for your students. I like my teacher. He makes me, she makes me feel good about myself. I enjoy my classes. I want to come to my classes. You're building up all of these positive associations by being interested and engaged with the people that you're with. And then, if they don't progress, and if they don't do their homework, you have less reason to blame yourself for it because you've created a positive <laughs> environment. So, Basically, what I'm saying is that making a good impression is actually really easy. All the other stuff, that's the hard work. <laughs>